Welcome to the world premiere of Bounty Hunter. This is the world premiere of the animated short film that uh, was created by UTS Animal Logic Academy. I just want to people of the Eora Nation, uh, we're sitting on their ancestral lands at the UTS City campus. Uh, they have a huge heritage of storytelling, which is foundational to what UTS is doing. It's foundational to what I studied at UTS. I'll get into that in just a moment. And telling stories is such a tradition in modern Australia that we pay respect to the elders past and present of the Gadigal people. And we acknowledge them as the tra traditional custodians of this land. Um, I want to thank you for joining this. It's always a little bit weird in this crazy world to be joining things virtually like this. We would love to be sitting on a stage flanked by a huge movie screen with all of you here uh, loudly chomping on popcorn and, uh, and eating ice cream. But this is second best. I hope you're all snuggled in and ready to enjoy a remarkable feat. For those of you who are involved in the production of the film, who are watching, I've got to say a huge congratulations. Um, I studied here at UTS. I did film, television and radio production then social, political and historical studies. That was all part of the communications degree when I did it and became a journalist and moved to New York. And I've been in New York for most of my life where I helped found HuffPost Live, which was a, a streaming uh, news channel, essentially. And I came back here a couple of years ago and now work at the ABC and do various other podcasty things. And you can hear me on, uh, on 7, 702 on ABC Radio Sydney. But while I was at UTS, I also made a short film, which won the UTS Golden Eye Awards. And uh, it was one of the hardest things I've ever done. So that was just shooting real live people and dealing with actual physical entities. Uh, I can't imagine how much harder it is to do it using nothing but pixels and ones and zeros. So a huge congrats to you. And we're going to be speaking tonight before we see the film with two people behind the film, Matt, Estella, and Jess Lyon. Let's meet them Hello. now. Matt, do you want to tell people who you are? Oh, sure. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm Matt Estella. Uh, I've got a background in uh, visual effects and computer animation that is about 20 years now. Um, so... I was uh, working in Sydney for a few years at a place called Z-Space and I went to London for many years where I worked at uh, Frank's store and the mill and a few other places. Then came back to Sydney to work at uh, Animal Logic where I got to work on some, some great projects. Uh, and then I came to the Animal Logic Academy about, about four years ago. So um, I do, uh, I've done a few things in my, in my career, but these days I'm mainly known for doing uh, effectsy things. So things exploding and, you know, splashy fire kind of hoo-ha. Um, That's pretty much all movies are these days, Matt. Things exactly exploding right. and flashy effects and hoo ha. Thanks a lot. I moved, I Thanks moved for across ruining into the, cinema. You're welcome. You're welcome, world. <laughs> um, but it, it's pretty good fun. And I think uh, it, was, it was kind of uh, interesting timing that just as I was getting, I wouldn't say jaded, but a little bit sort of, uh, it, it feels like it's, it's on a bit of a treadmill. This opportunity came up to come and, and teach here, and it's been fantastic. Yeah. And so, what's your role at the UTS Animal Logic Academy? Right, so my role is I'm the uh, VFX lead, which was a, um, we've given ourselves the most sort of catch-all generic title, so no one can pin us down to what we actually do. Um, this but, feels um, very much like the ABC. I'm totally at home. Ah, maybe, mm -hmm. I should, maybe we should talk afterwards. No, no, um, so uh, broadly speaking, um, to do any sort of like, you know, animation work or games work, uh, you've got, I guess, kind of uh, performance. So you've got, you know, animators, concentrating on, uh, on, uh, on how characters act and think and move and breathe. You've got uh, assets, which is people you know, building all the stuff which you see on screen. Uh, and then you've got sort of MISC other, which is you know, uh, technical processes and all this sort of stuff, which would be too hard to, to, to animate by hand. And um, I share some of that workload with some of the other uh, VFX leads here. So I do, uh, so I teach a piece of work that's called uh, uh, Houdini which is known for doing all that sort of explodey, explodey kind of stuff. Um, but I also cover a bit of the games technology side as well. Um, just, you know, and also a, a shoulder to cry on when, when needed, <laughs> you know, a, 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 a warm hand, a firm hug, all that jazz. Jess, is this true? You need to fact check this about Matt. Is he a, a warm <laughs> shoulder to cry on? Is he a nice person to hug? Tell people about, about your role, Jess. <laughs> 
Uh, well, absolutely. And that was uh, my supervisor in charge of me last year uh, when I was a student. So we had catch ups every so often where he would check in, see how I was going. So yes, definitely a lot of warm hugs and shoulders to cry on. And tell us a little bit about yourself, Jess. Um, so I was a student here last year, as I said, I came from a background of fine arts and arts. So at, I studied creative writing and um, painting and drawing at UNSW. So I came in with a completely 2D sort of um, field background. Um, and then last year I went on to do some art direction. So I did some concept and art and design. And then I also did some surfacing, um, some lighting, um, some compositing. And then we also went into the the immersive technologies in our second term where I got to do some game design and play around with things like Unity and so on. So yeah. And now I am doing, I am a junior compositor at Flying Bark, which is an animation studio here in Sydney. Yeah. And uh, this, uh, this course has uh, an insane level of graduate uh, job placement, doesn't it? So it's not unusual for someone to do this course and then find themselves uh, at a hotshot production company. What was, uh, what was your, in what capacity were you working on Bounty Hunter, Jess? Uh, uh, well, I was, so I was doing art direction in Bounty Hunter, but I was also doing, um, heading up some look development in surfacing. And then I was also lighting lead as well and did compositing as well. So I was sort of spread out over the field, which a lot of the other students were as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Cool. Okay, so now you know a little bit about Jess Lyon and Matt Estella, the uh, student and teacher respectively, both of whom uh, were fundamental in, in the production of the, the movie that you're about to see. The movie will start in about eight minutes time. And the way that you're gonna watch it, just to give you an understanding of how the, this evening will unfold is we'll, we'll blabber for another seven or eight minutes. And then there's a link to the YouTube where the film will play in the chat box at the bottom of the screen. So if you go to the bottom of Zoom, you'll see that there's a, a chat box and we will post a link to the YouTube. It's a little bit clunky, I know, but because we want you to see it in the highest possible definition, we don't want you to be streaming it across Zoom with our ugly faces uh, obstructing your vision. There'll be a YouTube link. You will click across to the YouTube tab. You'll watch it at exactly quarter to the hour and uh, it runs for almost five minutes and then we'll come back and we'll spend about 45 minutes answering your questions and talking to Matt and Jess uh, about the course, about the industry, about the film, about how, the, how it all came together. And you can ask questions yourself by clicking on the Q&A tab at the bottom of Zoom. And Jess, we've actually got our first question before I even teased for it. Uh, someone, someone named uh, Jackie Robson is asking you a question, Jess, saying, what is surfacing and compositing and unity? You just mentioned these words. Uh, yeah, so surfacing is, um, we get the models for modeling and they usually have I'm trying not to get too technical here, but they have a few <laughs> maps that you essentially paint textures onto the model. So you get uh, the skin, you get um, clothing, um, you paint on all these patterns. So they get very colorful um, because before that they are actually in Lambert gray. So they're completely gray. And then in surfacing, they get all their textures. Um, compositing is essentially the end of the pipeline where you get all the final rendered images and you place them all together in layers. So it becomes a 2D image again for the screen. Um, and then that gets sent off to editing, the final edit, it gets sent off to clients, etc. And then Unity is a game development engine. So it's like Unreal, Unity, they are free. So you can use them very easily um, and you can do some game design in there and you can do some effects as well. So yeah. Cool. Uh, I should also just mention that we are recording this Zoom uh, and it will likely go up on, uh, on a UTS website after it's been edited and beautified and subtitled and, uh, and so on. So if, uh, if you, you miss anything, you can always check back in on it later. And of course, if you like the short film, then be sure to share it uh, on social media using the YouTube link uh, in, the, in the chat box. Um, let's talk about the movie now. Uh, an, an, an anonymous attendee has asked a question in the Q&A chat box saying, what are the influences behind Bounty Hunter? Bounty Hunter is, of course, a student work. That's the film that we're celebrating. It was created over the course of a year at the Academy. Matt, do you want to answer that question and tell us what the influences are behind us and how you would describe the film? 
Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I'd say that uh, a lot of the development of it comes up from us, from uh, the leads here, coming up with a with a, quite a vague, open-ended uh, challenge to them, where we almost sort of tend to set, I guess, technical constraints, where we say, okay, uh, uh, the previous films made by the Academy have been this, therefore we want this to be not that. So it's a lot of, I guess, kind of not constraints. So it's a, you know, um, this one, we, we don't want it to be completely, uh, I guess, dystopian sci-fi. Uh, we want this to have, uh, to be about two minutes in length. We want it to have two characters. We want it to look epic in scale. And so within those really broad um, kind of brief outlines, the students come back to us with a bunch of ideas. Uh, but I suppose uh, what is, what I guess the students don't, don't expect is that they will come up uh, with a bunch of ideas and then we'll say, uh, okay, uh, that's a great first pass, try again, because all of these ideas were pretty, pretty average. And the students go, oh, okay. And then they try again and we go, that's a little better, but come on, try again. And they get used to that constant pitch and repitch and repitch vibe. And then we start saying, well, a bit of idea one is not bad. A bit of idea 12 is not bad. How about you try and combine those things and pitch again? And we break our students up into little, into little cabals. Um, and uh, just from that, just constant uh, iteration and just revision and us kind of challenging them more and more, they come up with about seven quite cool ideas. Uh, and this one, it was a combination where I think one of the first sort of uh, insights to what this film was going to be was a bit of, I guess, almost throwaway concept art uh, Jess had done, where we looked at that and went, oh, that's quite a cool striking image. And almost from kind of starting to, to, starting to ask questions about, okay, uh, what is what is now behind this image? You know, because uh, it, uh, it, was, it was a tiny little uh, humanoid character against a giant sort of a really expansive looking fancy world and we just start to ask more questions okay you know, you know, who was that person what is that world why is he there and and so it goes and so the, the influence has almost sort of come up on the fly where we keep we keep asking questions the students keep having to panic provide answers um, and as a result x months later we get a film like this Jess, Matt just said that it was your illustration that inspired uh, some of the early uh, innovations for the film. Where did that come from? Uh, so essentially when we became the art and design department, so we were broken up into different departments. Uh, the art and design essentially had to look at a lot of references, sci-fi references. Um, so it was a combination of looking at um, a few things like other sci-fi films um, also other art styles, which I thought were pretty cool and just sort of trying to draw something that was sci-fi within a very striking um, art style, really. Very mm -hmm. colourful is what we were going for. So just trying to use as much colour as possible. And uh, very quickly, we've got a question from a Samuel Sue in the Q&A chat box saying, how long did it take to create the film from when this was first outlined to the final cut? In less than 90 seconds, we'll crash into the movie. But Jess, do you want to take that real quick? Um, so it was the entire year, but we did take about 10 years, 10 weeks, 10 years, sorry. 10 years. 10 weeks out of that. <laughs> it felt like 10 years. I like that, 10 yeah. weeks out of that um, year to make our term two project, which was the immersive, um, immersive technology one in uh, Unreal, yeah. yeah. Okay, so everybody should open their YouTube page now using the link that's in the, in the chat box down the bottom. Don't close this because we're only just getting started. After the, after the film, you'll be able to ask as many questions as you want and we'll have a leisurely 45 minutes in which to answer them. So keep this, uh, this uh, tab open in your browser, but hop on over to YouTube where the film will begin. I don't have a seconds clock with me, but it probably feels like about 40 seconds time. One thing to watch out for, I'm told that there is actually a visual reference in the movie to a Ridley Scott alien character. I didn't notice it the first time I saw the film. I'll be watching for it this time and we'll find out exactly about all of that in just a moment. Let's take a look at the movie.
There you have it, Bounty Hunter, the incredible work of largely students at UTS Animal Logic Academy. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. You can come back to the Zoom conversation now or you can keep watching it again. You'll probably watch it again and again and again over and over again on YouTube if you want. Um, but we're about to have a conversation about exactly how it was created and about uh, the UTS Animal Logic Academy. If you've got any questions about either, please feel free to enter that question in the question dialogue box, which is at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Um, uh, Jess, uh, do you just want to tell us uh, about the, the look of the film? It's striking. It plays around with cliches and conventions of, the, of cuteness versus evil and so on. Where does the look come from? Um, the look is a bit of a variation. We were going 3D animation, so it is hard to try and differentiate from Pixar and Disney, but we wanted to go for something a little bit different. And we also wanted something that was clearly very colorful. So that's why all the lighting looked very, very colorful. Um, the character itself, um, Al Who, had to be very, very cute. So there was a lot of development on that creature, especially. Um, so it had to be cute, but then also really scary at the end with all the eyeballs and the mouth. So it was a lot of back and forth, um, but everyone really pulled together and made a really cute, cute hue, 
cute who, especially with the fur um, and everything. So, yeah. And uh, a question from uh, Luis Mota, uh, Matt, which you can take. How much professional experience did the students involved in the development of the film have before entering the program? Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, none really. So, I mean, uh, most of our intake tend to have completed some sort of uh, uh, undergraduates somewhere. So they come from quite a few places around Sydney and around Australia and also from overseas. Um, I mean, what we kind of, what we try and do is, what we like to say is um, a lot of uh, students who have finished an undergraduate program might have a, a thing which they you know, which they are passionate about, but it's not quite at that industry level yet. And so what we really try and do is to get people to, to take whatever skill they have up to industry standard. Uh, we have, we've had uh, a super talented uh tiny handful of people who have had uh, maybe not as much computer graphics experience as we would uh, like. So Jessica, one of them, uh, another one of our amazing students from last year was, was Anya, but um, they tend to be behind the eight ball a bit and they, uh, they often have to work very, very hard to, to catch up to the rest of the, the team. So, but, but generally speaking, people have some sort of experience in, in, in a field and we then push them up to standard. I mentioned uh, before the screening, Matt, that uh, there's a hidden reference to one of the world's greatest sci-fi uh, uh, horror films, really, Alien. Uh, yeah. can, you, can you tell us what the reference is? Yeah, yeah. So uh, in uh, the cave uh, that most of the action uh, happens in the second half of the film, there's uh, a funny looking alien tree in the middle of the set. Uh, if you look really closely at that, uh, I, I don't know if you can even see it in the finished film because we, we end up focusing somewhere else, but uh, Anya came up uh, for the whole life cycle for that little uh, poo alien creature. And uh, it turns out that it's grown on that tree. And so if you look very closely, you can see that there are tiny little uh, uh, embryo poos grown as fruit on the tree. <laughs> and we went through uh, a whole amazing uh, uh, book dev session, making these like horrible looking kind of, you know, sort of um, kind of uh, uh, in utero egg sacs, which are just sort of gently pulsing and spinning on the tree. It was, it was some fantastically disgusting work, which is just one of the little kind of throwaway gags in the film, so. Yeah, I think some of them are, are glowing. Um, so we do have some of them glowing in the film. Um, there's a few shots where they're slightly off in the corner. If you look really hard, you can see some little shapes in there that are the, the embryos, yeah. Uh, Timothy Thompson writes in the, in the questions, uh, can we have the who as an emoji, please? So yeah, I'll take that as a comment, maybe. maybe <laughs> that's the next project to work on. And, uh, and Jovan Tomasevich uh, say, writes, uh, aside from Unity and Houdini, what other softwares were used to create the film, like with the hair, for example, Jess? Um, so the hair was created in Houdini, I believe. Um, yep. One of the students, um, Liz, did a lot of development on the hair with Matt. So she'd been working on that pretty much all year. Um, so we came up with some colors, choose. Um, we went through several different um, types of colors for the who and settled just on white and blue, I believe. Um, but yeah, so there was like a, one where it was more sort of golden, like a golden retriever and there was more purplish, there was pink versions. So a lot of development went on to the mm. fur in Houdini. Um, but other projects that we do use, uh, we use Katana. Um, we also use Substance Painter for the surfacing. So Katana is for lighting, Substance Painter for surfacing. Nuke is for compositing. Um, we did modeling in ZBrush and also Maya. And then we did layout in Maya as well. Um, we did Photoshop for uh, a lot of the design work. Wow. Uh, the one that I'm missing, what was the edit in DaVinci or something? Yeah, the edit and the final grade was in, was in DaVinci Resolve. Uh, yeah. the, the animation and rigging was in Maya. Yeah. The rendering was in RenderMan. The other things is, um, I mean, basically what we do is we, we, we really try and sort of mirror uh, industry practices. So. I think it's 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 very easy to kind of to be swayed by um, some of the I guess marketing spiels by the, the soft companies where they say oh if you just use this this package you can do it all, and uh, but in reality um, as great as as all these pieces of software are, 
you really want to pick the best tool for the job. And so at a studio like say Animal Logic or Pixar or ILM, they're using a whole a whole suite of software and mm. we tr and we will mirror that here. And this is not just specific to filmmaking, right? There is a question. I should also emphasize uh, to, to viewers, if you want to ask a question, best to do it in the Q&A chat box. Some people are asking questions in the chat box. It's just easier for us to keep an eye only on the, on the Q&A and to look at the chats later. But this one is in the chat and I just want to put it to you, Matt, because Roy Fu is saying, I want to get into the visual side of games design specifically. I've got a particularly strong character design and visual direction kind of things, but will doing a year in this course help me find a place for myself since it is filmmaking rather than just making games? Do you want to just emphasize that uh, whilst we're celebrating an amazing short film tonight, the course is not just about filmmaking? Yeah, sure. I mean, what is, uh, I guess, a certain uh, irony is that while myself and Alex and Dan uh, the three leads here we all have a background in in filmmaking and in uh, visual effects the academy itself is actually getting more recognition and winning more awards for all of our games work so uh the way the year runs is we spend uh the first third of the year working on the short film and we get it to maybe say halfway complete and we park it then we spend the middle third of the year investigating uh, all of the new emerging technology so so we look at games, we look at VR, we look at AR, we look at you know data visualization, just whatever is sort of cutting edge. And again, we uh, in a similar way of getting the students to pitch the short film, we we get them to pitch new emerging tech ideas. And so, in fact, on the wall uh, behind you there, Josh, is some of the pitch work from uh, some of our uh, real-time projects. And behind Jess is some of the work from some of the other real-time projects. Um, and that becomes a real uh, boot camp where uh, my other analogy, I'm big on uh, really labored analogies, is the first the first semester is a real sort of, I guess, kind of Mr. Miyagi, Karate Kid, kind of you know, uh, uh, paint the fence, wax on, wax off. I realized that only you and I would get that reference. Everyone else here <laughs> who was under the age of 25 won't get it. But then Are you implying the second... that I'm over the age of 25? I take no, deep no, offense, no, 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 no. Deep yes, offense. yes, yes, yes. I'm, I'm completely implying that. Um, but then... Um, the second, the second and third semester is where we really say, okay, now show me, you know, show me, you know, wax on wax off, show me paint the fence. And so we, we kind of leave it to the students then to kind of show us what they can do. Uh, and that gets quite interesting where, uh, again, like uh, where is the short film will be a team of say you know, 20 to 30 people. Uh, that, that process of, of pitching real time projects, the teams shrink down to maybe say six or seven people. And, uh, you know, they all have to learn it from scratch. They all have to, you know, sort of get up to speed and they have to learn uh, Unreal at a rapid rate of knots. They have to learn Unity at a rapid rate of knots. They have to learn about all this real-time te technology to make some pretty amazing uh, game and real-time prototypes, which is really, really cool. Can you just remind people how long the course is and what the collaboration is with Animal Logic? Yeah, sure. And who's so eligible? Right, so uh, the, it's a one-year master's. So uh, I think normally a master's is a year and a half to two years. So we try and, and compress that into one year, uh, which means that um, we run uh, sort of, it's a, we also try and, and as part of the process of getting people ready for industry, we do kind of simulate work hours. So it's Monday to Friday, nine to five, people have to, you know, people have to actually you know, clock in and clock out. Um, in terms of uh, the relationship to Animal Logic, um, so I've heard bits of the story. I was involved in some of the, 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 the early kind of talks, but from what I understand, uh, a lot of the kind of, I guess, impetus for this was that uh, UTS and Animal Logic are quite friendly. And there were, there were a few discussions being had of, of, of pointing out that uh, Animal Logic and most animation studios in the world are, are desperately looking for people, but um, they just weren't able to hire a lot of the graduates. They just didn't quite have the skills that are needed. And so uh, because of the relationship between Animal and uh, UTS, uh, the question was put up saying, well, why don't we work together and try and, and make a course to do that? And that's what this is. So um, I think we, we aggressively sort of you know, move fast, you know, break things, get out of our comfort zone all the time, but we're trying to push everyone to industry standard. And it's, it's pretty amazing where uh, if you sort of compare people's uh, showreels when they come in 
to when they leave. So this entire industry, like with a lot of this sort of kind of media visual art stuff, it's it's ultimately based around your show reels. So you so you would collect you know, a minute, two minutes of your best work that goes onto Vimeo, and that is your your calling card. And uh, the show reels people have at the start of the year versus the end of the year are just staggeringly, you know, the the quality boost is just you know, exponential. Mm-hmm. Uh, in terms of um, qualifications, in terms of you know how you are how you are eligible to, to be here, it's like most masters. So you have to have some sort of undergraduate degree to start with, or um, or a equivalency. Uh, I think there are sort of explanations of that on the website. Um, but uh, beyond that, it's again we we try and sort of simulate the work uh, the work environment as much as possible. So it comes down to an interview, and so we will you know we will have a little a half hour to put a minute chat, asking for people's interests and what they want to do and what do they want to get out of the year and are they really ready for it. You know we we really want to make sure that we get a, a team of so super committed people here, um, and it's it's working pretty well. Mm. You don't have to have done an undergraduate graduate degree specifically in this field. No, but then the the pressure is on then to show why you have a skill that we can push up to industry standards. So mm. I think um, we, with it being one year and us moving so quickly, we, we really just don't have the time to get people uh, skilled up from from, from scratch. Um, you just got to be good. Said, you just got to be good. good. Uh, uh, that. Just like in the real world. Yeah, and I'd say that it's good is kind of yeah good is a great benchmark to have but i think just kind of competent and keen to learn so yeah you know we've had people who have uh you know who have said who have approached us in say april said you know i would love to come study with you guys knowing that our intake is in january and we say okay can you show us what you have and they do and we go okay it's not quite there yet but they've got you know eight or nine months to to learn and so you know i really think that if you are you know keen and able you can get a lot of what you need from the University of YouTube. You know, it's it's pretty capable of. You know, if you want to learn the basics of how to model in Maya, there's endless YouTube tutorials for that. You know, if you want to learn ZBrush, Houdini, whatever piece of software it is, you are able to learn that online. What what, what we do here is that sense of you know again getting people up to industry standard, and so you know we get people used to you know regular, sometimes quite brutal you know, criticism people working in big teams working to deadlines all that stuff you know and that's what what really kind of separates i guess kind of hobbyists from people who are ready to work in in the industry let's get back to the to the movie uh if you're just joining yeah. us uh we're speaking with matt Estella, who's the the vfx lead at uts animal logic academy and uh, jess lyon who's one of the students who worked on bounty hunter uh last year i'm josh Sepps. i'm a broadcaster at, uh, at the abc and a uts alum uh, a lot of people, Jess, are asking uh, something about what a sort of day looks like when you're actually working on a film like this and what the division of labour is. If you've got 25 or 30 people all working on the same film, what are you doing? Uh, so, sorry, I got booted, so my video's not working yet. But <laughs> okay. um, essentially, because we're divided across departments, um, a lot of people are working on different things all at the same time. Um, hang on, let me just go. Okay. There you are. Yeah, so a lot of people are working on the same uh, different things at the same time. At the start of the year, we start with proficiency tests. So we have a week of just like mapping out how proficient we are at different things. Um, so one day we might be pre- uh, doing proficiency tests on coding and on compositing. Um, another day we might be doing proficiency tests on modeling and animation. But essentially that is a, it's just a bar that sets us at the beginning to see what we're good at. But we can also, um, tell the uh, supervisors what we're interested in pursuing, but essentially how we go and um, what we're interested in just sets out um, what we're gonna work on throughout the year. Um, So at the start, when I was in art and design department, there were people in the story department doing storyboards, figuring out the edit. There was also people in previs and layout. So they were laying out all the 3D assets in a certain way uh, so that we could see how the story would progress in a 3D environment. And then throughout the end of the year, because we had two different projects going on. So we had half the studio working on the project behind me, which was Sabakwa, our immersive technology one. And we also had half the studio completing um, Bounty Hunter so that was lighters, um, compositors, um, and effects as well. So uh, essentially day nine to five, you're just uh, 
working throughout the day and then you have a dailies during the day. So you have to submit stuff in to review during that dailies. Then you get feedback from the supervisors. Is it working? What do you need to change? And then you take that feedback and you uh, work on it. To the real novices who have never done visual effects at all, can you break it down as if we were eight years old and talk about <laughs> the, the, the very beginning of putting this together? I mean, is like each element in the film is each element created separately? And then are you programming how that element is gonna behave, whether, whether that's a character or an object? Are they, and you're then compositing them together at the end? Like literally, how is it put together? Um, so we actually had a producer last year, Addie. She um, broke down every single asset and every single task that we had to do into uh, tasks that were given to people. Um, some of these tasks uh, had to be modeled and then some of those models had to be rigged. So they had to have a skeleton put inside it to be animated, but not every model. Um, and then some of the tasks were effects tasks. So the effects team would take those tasks and they would just um, start developing the look of the effects. Um, some of the tasks were, I should say design comes essentially before all the modeling really, because you get mm. a concept. And then from that concept, you start modeling that concept um so that it looks like the concept and then so was there, was there a physical real world model of each of the characters <laughs> real world no <laughs> it was made in <laughs> maya it was made right in so when you say that you're putting a skeleton on it what does that mean essentially rigging is putting a skeleton in like you're putting joints um, and bones into this 3D model on a computer in Maya so that those joints can behave in a certain way when animators start animating them. Um, yeah, so you can start. Yeah, um, I was going to say a good, um, uh, a good analogy is uh, if you think about, say, stop motion, which, which most people have more of a tangible sense of, uh, you can have uh, very kind of amor amorphous, fluid, say, plasticine-based animation, like, say, the old uh, Gumby cartoons. But if you move up to, say, something like, say, Coraline or to Wallace and Gromit, um, they're not just lumps of plasticine. They have uh, a, a physical metal skeleton in inside it, which are then form plasticine and, and, and silicon and other materials over it so that animators have an ability to keep the structure, I guess, kind of on model and... and and always of same proportions. Uh, the other analogy would be to say puppets. So, so if you are designing a marionette, you have to think about you know uh, how are all the parts of the marionette uh, are bound together. Uh, how do the strings connect up to the top control surfaces? Um, imagine all of those things, but uh, on the computer. Mm -hmm. So uh, you you wouldn't necessarily want all of your animators hand modeling uh, a character's facial performance on every frame because they would very rapidly fall out of whack or out of sync or modelers may not be, sorry, animators may not be good, good modelers, but if they can understand performance and if you can give them a slider that says happy or sad or you know, no, eyebrow down, eyebrow up, then they can push that, uh, that I guess, kind of emotional performance through. And a big part of, um, of, of this, I guess, industry is you're trying to uh, parallelize out the tasks. So whereas we'd say uh, stop motion, ultimately you would have to have, you know, people designing a set and then building a set and then placing lights and then placing a camera, but then it all comes to a, a, a point where it's just one stop motion animator versus a set and a character and a camera, and you just have to wait for them to do their thing. Uh, computer animation tries to be more efficient. so wherever we can, we try and, and, and parallelize, parallelize out all the tasks. So we'll have design running concurrently with people modeling, people animating and stuff. And, and then more to the point, uh, it is a iterative thing. So where it's say with stop motion, once you capture that performance, that's done and it's locked and you really don't want to reopen it again. With computer animation, we just keep going back and we just keep polishing and we keep doing it again and again and again until it looks right. And so, you know, people I think often um, get slightly alarmed by the amount of times we do uh, redo things. So, say for uh, the main um, uh, the main Who alien character, uh, Liz Haddonfield, who was in charge of the fur, 
she redid the fur. I think in the end, we got up to about version 170, version 180 over the year. Um, some of the, some of the, uh, some of the shots. So, so, so for a little you know, three second clip, animators would get up to say version 60, version 70. I mean, it's just endless refining and refining and refining. It's amazing. That's, I don't know whether it's a good or a bad thing to be a perfectionist if you're in an industry like this, cause you'll just never finish anything. There's always one little tweak that I can make just to make it a little bit more perfect. Uh, we've got a, a question from Ian Laid, which is more of a comment, but it's worth reading because it's a testament to just the intensity of how much one learns at Animal Logic Academy. Ian says, just wanted to say a thanks to Animal Logic Academy. I stepped out of the course after finishing Bounty Hunter and went straight into a job at Luma Pictures. I can testify to the massive level up in my skills and my showreel. Plus it really does simulate working in a professional film studio. Uh, highly recommended. Jess, you came into the Academy just over a, a year ago and your background was in fine arts and, and 2D illustration with basically just a knowledge of, of Photoshop, but not of 3D or, or digital virtual effects. Um, now you're working across a whole range of animations, including Bounty Hunter. How do you find working in 3D? Uh, animation versus 2D? Um, 3D, I would say that I think the most, it wasn't really challenging to learn the software so much. It was just, um, you just had the right, have to have the right attitude about it. You just have to keep pushing. Plus um, ALA always supplies a lot of good tutorials. And we also have supervisors here who are willing to teach you pretty much anything. Um, so again, with Matt and Houdini, he just sat down all the effects artists pretty much every day from day one, just taught them Houdini stuff. Um, but you do get the same for animation. You do get the same for lighting. Um, you do get the same for surfacing. So uh, essentially, I don't think working in 3D is too different from working in 2D, actually. It's just another dimension to the, the space. Um, but coming from a 2D artist's perspective, uh, 2D helped with the 3D, I suppose, mm -hmm. um, if that makes sense, because in lighting especially, um, I would be doing um, some of the backgrounds in 2D, but then I would be taking that knowledge from the 2D backgrounds um, and using that to inform how I would light a scene in 3D, yeah. Some people are commenting on the, uh, the images that you can see behind us all, uh, we are all at UTS. We're in different rooms because we're practicing social distancing. Uh, but <laughs> yes, these are all, uh, th these are, this is all evidence of the creativity of, uh, of, of the folks here at Animal Logic Academy. Roy Fu has asked a question in the, uh, in the, and please feel free to continue to ask questions. We've still got about 15 minutes left uh, using the Q&A chat box at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Roy Fu says, uh, if programming is one of my weaker elements, what parts of it specifically should I try to learn about and improve so that I can greater contribute to that part of things while still making sure to nurture arts and design as a primary skill? Matt, do you have any tips about what in programming is essential, if anything? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I suppose it's good to say that it's, it's not essential. Um, I mean, I think there is a, a bit of a, a misnomer and a, and a, what's the word? Misnomer. We'll go with misnomer. Misconception. You, misconception, thank you. Um, that you have to be an amazing, you know, concept artist, modeler, rigger, animator, service programmer. No one is those things. I mean, that's just impossible. Um, what we tend to do is um, my... Again, one of my sort of labored analogies slash cheesy one line is, is to talk about the specialist generalist. And so I think what, uh, what we really try and encourage for our students is for them to pick their specialization, pick what they're good at, but be willing to have a go at other things. And it oftentimes comes down to interest. And so we've had students who, uh, who have come to us with a really strong coding background, but their interest is in learning how to do servicing. And so, and so they all then sort of push themselves forward as a, you know, as a service slash coder. We've had people who come in as an artist and they suddenly find themselves distracted and kind of intrigued by coding and they go that way. I, I, I don't think um, there's much need to force yourself into areas you don't really like or that you have no strong affinity for. Uh, but getting into the games and the real-time side is slightly different. It does it's help to know that stuff. But really, uh, you know, I think... Um, keeping it relevant to you. So I think uh, if, if you are pr primarily an artist uh, and you know a bit of Maya and a bit of substance, 
and you try and pick up like a, a super dry, you know, how to, you know, how to code in, in 14 days book, you're going to get nowhere. It's, it's too hard. But if you can find, uh, a, you know, some sort of tutorial or an online course or something which is relevant to you. So if it shows you, you know, how to code for Maya, or if you're a writer and, and, and you're using the software Katana and it shows you how to, how to write little bits of other code stuff for Katana, it's a much easier way to get into it and to get that hook. Because once you learn that at a base level, you can then sort of expand out and you go, oh, well, I've learned coding inside Katana. Well, I'm going to learn coding for Luke and then for Maya and then for Unreal. And you can, you can build up and build up and build up. Mm. Yeah. And Google is your best friend in this sort of thing. So like Unity, Unreal, pretty much anything. So coding, a lot of coders, I know, just Google things. Um, I did a lot of Googling for the Term 2 projects using Unity, Unreal. I was just like Google all the time. I uh, did the same for Katana and Substance. So, yeah, pretty much just the internet is there and you got to use it. <laughs> and how, how necessary is technical expertise, Jess? Because uh, Timothy Thompson has asked a question saying, to create such a movie, how much of an artist do you need to be and how much of a computer geek? I guess it's about 50-50, wouldn't it be? Yeah, it's pretty much uh, you got to enjoy films. You have to enjoy games if you want to go into games. And then if you see yourself as an artist uh, and you have worked as an artist, you've worked yourself up um, doing the things you love, like drawing or um, modeling or anything, you just have to, essentially it's all about interest um, because interest will be the driving force to teach you the programs and um, everything else. Like you can't, really teach someone interest it's something you have to have the passion um first so the passion is the most important part mm, it's true um, of any of any yeah. creative of any creative field uh, yeah. matt did you yeah, want to exactly. jump in there uh, yeah i did uh, just what i wanted to say as well is that i think uh again it, it's very easy to fall in, uh, under that misconception, misconception good word thank you of um <laughs> that you have to be a really strong technical person and a really strong artistic person for this the reality is that it is uh uh, a spectrum and so you know right down one end you've got you know super artistic people who are working in say art department and they're just doing nothing but you know painting on canvases and being super arty and right down the other end you've got say uh, research and development which is you know full-time coders doing amazing stuff making you know maths and numbers whiz through the fingers but there is a huge amount of roles in between and so you can pick whatever given ratio of that sort of artist versus coder role and there is a slot for that. And so, and so say if you are an, an animator, you are primarily uh, focused upon a performance, but you need to know, you know a little bit of you know, my, a little bit of you know, computer animation and the technical tools under the hood to be able to be efficient. If you slide a bit further the other way, if you are say um, a, 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 a servicing artist, and especially if you are doing some of the more advanced servicing materials well you've got to be more say a 50 50 split and that continuum goes right down to being a, a coder so uh, again i think it, it's very easy to 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 start to um self-harm and go oh i, I you know i don't know coding or oh no i'm a really terrible artist i'm never going to make it no if you can you can work at just any kind of ratio within those two fields you can generally find a role for you in this industry I want to talk about the broader context of this whole industry. Um, Australians punch well above their weight on in creative fields, certainly in acting, and we're great filmmakers. The animation and visual effects industry, specifically in Australia, has just been going gangbusters in recent years. A lot of Hollywood studios are bringing work to Australia as well. Do we know why that is, Matt? Um, I mean, the blunt uh, fact is is money. Um, you know, with with the Aussie dollar being being very very uh, poor against the US, uh, and with um, it just makes it cheaper to do things here. But there is also a recognition that uh, that there are a lot of uh, studios in Australia who can do uh, you know world quality work. And so you know, Animal Logic uh, has won uh, Oscars for, for, for their films. You know, with, uh, Animal Logic is constantly recognised for its amazing visual effects work. But there's also you know, uh, Luma in Melbourne and Method and Plastic Wax and there's a ton of studios and flying bucks, especially just doing amazing, amazing quality work. Um, the other side of it, in terms of like right now, what, what there, I think there's a sudden spike in interest here is the, I mean, the other kind of blunt 
uh, uncomfortable truth is is COVID and how we, we handle it here. It, it, it looks like we are sort of opening the door to productions earlier than is possible in the States. And so, you know, Netflix still have to get work done. And so productions that would have otherwise not been shot in Australia are coming in. I mean, that'll be, that'll be good in the short term. But Jess, I think this is a longer term thing, right? I mean, before COVID and before a weak dollar, Australia was still, a, you know, this was one of the industries in Australia that had a, a stratospheric growth rate. Are you optimistic about the, the future of the industry? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, we have like courses like this one, we have all these students coming out of it. Um, and I think the government and Australia is try starting to realize that students um, like us and also students like IT students are going overseas to get jobs when they're being trained up here. So it would give uh, the government more interest to actually bring studios over to Australia so that they can keep um, the students in Australia. Yep. Mm. Uh, yeah. Um, what can we expect next from the Academy, Matt? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, so uh, this is a cohort. We've got uh, around about 40 students this year. And uh, can I also just interrupt because a lot of people are also wondering what, what the situation is this year. You mentioned COVID, but um, mm. I've got a question from Jackie Robson saying, mm. has the COVID lockdown meant that all Animal Logic Academy students are working from home? And if so, how does it work with accessing or using the different tools and platforms that you need? Has the lockdown time dramatically slowed down the timings for delivery on the work of the students? Yeah, good question. Um, it was, uh, you know, we were under a similar kind of, you know, what's going to happen? Will we, won't we shut, shut down or not? And then we got the word to say, okay, everyone, uh, everyone home. Uh, luckily, we have a pretty amazing uh, uh, IT team here who, with one week's notice, managed to go from basically nothing set up for working from home to having uh, students all be able to log into their workstations from home. And we were kind of setting up, I guess, contingency plans amongst, amongst the leads. Don't tell the students this, but we were kind of saying, oh, you no, know, we might have to, you know, uh, lower quality or shorten the film or limit the scope of it. We haven't had to do it. Um, the students turned out some amazing work uh, and we're just trucking on business as usual, really. So I think, um, and that is, that has continued through until now. So it's, it's quite funny if, if I could risk lifting my, my, my iPad to show you, but we've got a room full of workstations here. And um, during the day, you see all the monitors flashing and blinking, which is all the students logging in from home and doing the work. Uh, so we've had to adapt. I mean, and it's again, that sort of mirroring of the industry where um, all, of the, all of the animation studios have to do the same. Um, so we are, you know, so we are regularly communicating through Slack. We're talking through Zoom. And are the connections good enough that they're able to edit on software at UTS from home, or do they have local versions of the software? Uh, a bit of both. So uh, for everything that we can work from from here, we will do it uh, uh, remotely. Uh, a few people have have been able to do that, and so again, uh, our our IT team as well as Dan Flood, our um, our, our CD supervisor and tech lead came up with some very clever workflows that we could be, that they could uh, copy automatically a ton of work to their workstations. They can do the work there and then that can be pushed back and it's all kind of seamless. It's, it's mm. very cool. Jess, uh, lastly, just getting back to the, the actual plot and like the creation of a story rather than just the creation of images that look pretty. Uh, Owen Rady writes in the, in the question and answer box, what kind of story development were the students involved with? So essentially at the start of the term, we, uh, so we broke up into teams, we did our pitches and we chose our pitch. But after that, uh, Alex came in, um, he's one of the supervisors this year, but he came in and we essentially in one day, like a few hours, we just blocked out the story, went through all the beats um, and then everyone had suggestions for the beats. Um, and that was all a big collaborative process. Um, after that, essentially, how the story looked and everything uh, got handed off to the story department um, and also the previous department. And between those two departments, uh, they both tried to figure out the best way to show the edit for the story. So it is a very collaborative process. The entire studio does get very much involved with it. Um, but the whole nitty gritty of the storyboards is actually um, sorted out by those departments while the art and design focuses more on the look. 
Yeah. One of the things that I think anyone who's looking towards the future technological evolution of the 21st century likes to think about is virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, the extent to which we're all going to be have our experience of the world mediated by digital effects. Um, Jess, are you going to stay in film production? Are you interested in VR and AR? You, you're, you're more experienced in this than I am. Can you kind of put on your prognosticator's hat and tell me what things are <laughs> going to be like in 20 years? Uh, 20 years, I'm not too sure. It'd be great to see more VR and AR. I personally am more interested in getting into game design and story for games. So definitely going down that um, road is very much an interest to me. But you can sort of see the merging of uh, games and film already starting to happen with the use of Unreal in series such as um, The Mandalorian. Um, there's Can also you explain to people what Unreal is? Uh, Unreal is a game development software like Unity. Um, so essentially they're using a lot of uh, uh, real-time cameras in Unreal to do a lot of shooting. Um, so that's been happening on The Mandalorian. They've also been using uh, backdrops in Unreal in The Mandalorian as well. Um, and Unreal also released the, the new trailer for Unreal 5, which is clearly showing that they are also thinking of going down this um, film and TV road as well with the implementation of ZBrush figures into an Unreal scene. So ZBrush figures have a lot of polys. They're very high poly. They can slow down games quite a lot, but um, I think Unreal is trying to become more powerful to allow that for film and TV. Mm. I mean, even in gaming, aren't we going to be consuming our games through virtual reality in the future? Yes, I hope uh, virtual reality does become more of a thing, um, uh, more affordable, definitely by the general public. Mm. I know Alex, um, which is a VR game, um, Half-Life Alex came out recently, um, and they've been doing some really cool things with um, just interactable objects in VR. So... I definitely can see a future where VR and AR become more involved with our everyday life. Yeah, Matt, what do you think? What's your, uh, what's your prognostication? Uh, I think it'll be everything. So, you know, if you cut your mind back to when, uh, to when TV first started to have a lot of influence in the 50s and there was a lot of you know, doom and gloom, the sky is falling, TV is gonna ruin film and all that kind of stuff. But it wasn't that, it was, it was both. You know, there was room for both experiences, and and then when uh, when video games arrived on the scene, it was a doom and gloom. Oh my God, no TV's going to die, and film's going to die. No, nope. there was room for that as well. Uh, when all the, the online streaming services kicked off, you know, just recently, still people are you know, saying doom and gloom, film is going to die. No, nope, it's still around. I think VR and AR is going to be exactly the same thing. You know, it's, it's just another screen, and you know, there are things which work great in VR. There are things that work terribly in VR. In just the same way that things were, were, were great in games, terrible in games, great in film, terrible in film, great in TV, terrible in TV. But in terms um, of the, in terms of the kinds of pursuits that young people should think about skilling themselves up for, it's hard to imagine that anyone would want to sit in front of a computer and a webcam the way we are now in order to interface. <laughs> if in fifteen years' time it's affordable for us to just be sitting at home with a VR headset on and for it to actually look like we're all in the same room and for people to be able to be watching the film as if they were in an auditorium. Absolutely. And I think what is sort of um, interesting to, to keep in mind with all that is that no matter what the base medium is, film, TV, game, VR, AR, the tools to make stuff, to actually push pixels onto those screens, it's all the same stuff, you know, like uh, you know, Maya, Houdini, Rene Man, Katana, whatever it is, these are, it will always be the same tools used to make stuff for those things. And, you know, the, the the number and volume of the screens is only going to multiply. So I think th there's always going to be pretty big demand for people with these skills in this industry. Excellent. And UCS Animal Logic Academy is the place to get skilled up for just such oh, yeah. an industry. Um, thanks to, to everyone for, for being part of this and for, for joining us. And a huge congratulations again to everyone who was involved in the production of Bounty Hunter. If you want to learn more about what's going on at the Academy and where a career in animation and visualization might be able to take you. Uh, join us in a couple of weeks uh, at our upcoming session. It's called Intergalactic Worlds. That's the, the screenshot of it there, International Careers. 
Uh, it'll be on July 2nd, and we're going to talk all things global with Matt and also with Ben Skinner, who's the technical director at Canada's Tangent Animation and a former student at the Academy. Uh, we'll be sending out invites soon. Uh, so keep up to date with, uh, with tips and tricks and get inspired by the Academy's latest projects by following all the social channels, checking out the Academy's websites. There are the social channels there. A big thanks and congratulations once again. And thanks to Matt Estella and Jess Lyon. I'm Josh Sepps. Have a great night. Thank you.